a barbecue hero with delicious ultra low net carb hero bread buns and tortillas soft and fluffy high in fiber and with zero grams of sugar up to 10 grams of protein coming in at under 100 calories per serving oh and did i mention they taste like their mouth-watering traditional versions i mean what's not to love use code ah10 for 10 percent off your first hero bread purchase at hero.co that's AH10 for 10% off at hero.co. This is Make It Plain. Make It Plain. M I P. With Massimella Matsumo. Mark Thompson. Make It Plain. Get woke. Ladies and gentlemen, as the COVID-19 vaccine is being rolled out around the world and in America, eventually, we thought we'd do well to have a conversation about some of the myths around the vaccine, some of the things that people are concerned about. My guest was with us uh, earlier in the year, we were dealing with this, and she gave us some really sound expertise in terms of contact tracing. Well, we talked about it, even though we both lamented it wasn't happening. Uh, <laughs> but we talked about the importance of it and why it should have happened to a larger degree than it did if we had had leadership um, that was willing to get it done. Um, she's a practicing physician. She covers, she's a writer who also covers topics in medicine and public health. She's trained in internal medicine and pediatrics with specialties in infectious diseases and clinical microbiology and served as a disease detective at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. As a researcher, she is focused on the prevention and treatment of HIV and malaria in resource-poor countries. She's worked as a medical epidemiologist in the New York City Health Department, and she joins us once again from the ATL. Dr. Karen Landman, we're happy to have back here with us on Make It Plain. How are you? I'm pretty good, Mark. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me back. How have you been? Been good. You know, we all just just holding on, you know, and um, I think the holidays are going to be tough. I, I'm not as big of a Thanksgiving person as I am Christmas because it's right around my birthday. Oh. And, and so um, I, I, I'm not cherishing the thought of just not being able to go anywhere and do I usually travel during Christmas. I, you know, you can't do anything. So. You know, so that's this. I know others have had different periods of the year when it's been like that for them, but I think it's going to hit me now. <laughs> that yeah. here, so, but other than that, healthy, you know, fine, blessed, uh, and just wondering about this vaccine. You know, I've been been talking to people, even talking to people offline, friends, trying to figure out what they're going to do, what they should do. And there's a lot out here. Uh, there's a lot of information, and there's a lot of disinformation. So I'm glad you're here to help yeah. try to to figure out some of it and give us all the answers because <laughs> Karen's going to give us all the answers. And when we lead this conversation, we will know everything, everything. about what we should and should not be doing. Okay. So she's going to help us out. We're going <laughs> to bank on that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs> my, um, pr- our producer, Brittany had, had, had found the Mayo, Cl- Mayo clinic kind of released you all the lists of myths. And when you hear them, you'll, You've heard them. You probably have thought of some of them, your very selves. So let's walk through some of these. Um, um, Yeah, I heard this one just yesterday. COVID vaccines will alter my DNA. Somebody called and told me that yesterday, a a relative. I was like, really? I hadn't heard that one. So what's up with that, Karen? Okay. So I think First of all, it's 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 false. Um, So let me just start with that. And um, What actually happens is, um, uh, let me back up and maybe try and help people understand a little bit about why this confusion might happen. Um, The vaccines that are, um, that so far have released data, the the ones that are, are most likely to be approved first are what are called mRNA vaccines. And mRNA is part of the genetic material that is, um, it's not part of it. It's, it is a product of the genetic material that's in your cell. So think about it like 
Okay, you know, we all know what the DNA is, right? The DNA is the genetic material in your cells. It's kind of like the master cookbook that your body uses, that all the cells in your body use to make all the stuff your cells need to make you work. Um, and mRNA is sort of like if you were to photocopy a page of that cookbook and then give it to the cooks in the cell, um, that's how it would know to make you know, a certain kind of protein that your your cell needs to, to do whatever it does. Um, and once it uses that photocopied recipe, it burns it, it throws it away, it doesn't need it anymore. So your body does this already with mRNA. And mRNA in this situation is that photocopied disposable copy of the recipe. Now, these vaccines contain mRNA. So they contain basically a photocopy of something else's uh, recipe to make something. And what this mRNA does is it um, is a recipe for making a spike of the outside envelope of the COVID, of the co coronavirus that is COVID-19. So it makes a tiny piece of the COVID virus. Um, once you're, once this virus, the vaccine is injected into the body, your cells have available to them a photocopied recipe for how to make this protein. And so they use this recipe to make the protein and then they throw that recipe away. So it doesn't actually get integrated into the DNA, which would be the master cookbook here. It gets used as a recipe and then thrown away just the same way it does when our body makes mRNA. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't alter your genetic code is what I'm saying. Um, yeah, but I don't even, so, but let me just ask you, cause I think it's also important to figure out what is stuff. Where did anybody even come up with that? Well, how does do we know how that even evolved? Because I really, what that was said to me is it caught me off guard. I was like, whoa, I, I never heard anything like that. Do, yeah. do we have any idea how that even? You know, I'm not an expert on the history of mRNA vaccines, but I do know that they have been used in research worldwide for years. Um, and I think they've been explored as a possibility for a cancer vaccine um, because they um I actually don't even really know the reasons why, but they have been explored in a lot of uh, a lot of situations for um, for other types of vaccines. I think what makes them appealing to scientists is that they're a lot easier to make than other vaccines are. So the way that we have for decades been making vaccines is we take um, we take the thing that we're trying to vaccinate against, like, let's say, um, what's a good one? Like the tetanus bacteria. And we, um, we either injure the bacteria so it can't hurt a person or we kill the bacteria so it can't hurt a person or we chop up the bacteria into little bits. Um, and then we make, um, you know, we inject those you know, after testing, we inject either that, that inactivated or dead virus or little bits of the virus into people to help basically train the immune system to respond to that, um, to that bacteria or that virus if it ever actually infects them. This is really different. Um, this is basically just taking a recipe for making a part of that, uh, that virus or bacteria and injecting that. And it's a chemical compound. And it takes a lot less time to make that chemical compound than it does to figure out how to successfully and safely inactivate or kill or chop up the thing that you're trying to protect a person against. So it's just a, a much faster process to make this. So that makes it an appealing vaccine. A great segue to the next question. Here's another big one. And this is one we hear more commonly. COVID-19 vaccines are not safe because they were developed and tested quickly. This just happened too fast. Something is just too quick. Something must be wrong with it. Yeah. What do you say to that. So I think that is um, uh, of all the concerns and, and you know myths about that this vaccine. I think that is the one that is most relatable to me because mm -hmm. it's absolutely true that we do not have the time. Just the we don't we haven't had the duration of follow up for this. Uh, vaccines trial period that we normally have for vaccines. I mean, we've been using a lot of the vaccines that we use today, we've been using for decades. And that's, you know, these are worldwide vaccines used worldwide, which means we have 
billions of person years. It's sort of a, a, a geeky term, but this is basically when you multiply the number of people that you use a vaccine in times the number of years of follow-up you have, it's a lot of years, a lot of experience we have with this vac- with those vaccines. This is very different. Um, there's no other way for it to be, right? Like if you want a vaccine that's made months after um, a pandemic starts, by definition, you're not going to have more than a few months of experience with that vaccine. So reasonable to be concerned about the long-term safety effects of this. Um, Short-term, we know a lot about the safety and we know that these are very safe vaccines. Um, We know, you know, we, I mean, you saw how quickly we heard the recommendation from the UK that people with severe allergic reactions to food or medicines shouldn't take the vaccine. It was the same day they started administering the vaccine. They saw that they had some severe reactions in people with allergies and made that recommendation known worldwide. So we have a very good system in place to pick up the short-term safety effects of this vaccine. Um, This is a good time for us to talk about the fact that we don't actually, you know, we, we, we know that um, this vaccine has a side effects that are significant in people who take it. A lot of people feel like they have the flu for a couple of days or um, even up to five days. I've heard from people who've been in these trials um, mm-hmm. after they take the vaccine. Um, these are normal. They go away. They are reversible. Um, and they're actually a sign that your immune system is responding well to the vaccine and doing what it should do, which is, you know, make make the all the proteins and all the little soldiers it makes to fight off a real infection. And they're in contrast, um, you know, these side effects are in contrast to the uh, complications of actually getting infected with COVID, where it's an uncontrolled immune response. And, you know, the effects we're finding, it's not clear that all the effects are reversible, certainly not death and, and, you know, some of the severe lung damage we've seen from it. So, um, so all that to say, <laughs> rambling here a little bit, but oh. we, we don't really know what the long-term side effects of this are. Um, that's the way it is when we start, when any new vaccine or new medicine is rolled out. Um, and there's a good system in place to uh, learn about those and act on them as quickly as we find out about them. So I personally, um, you know, the the science behind mRNA vaccines is very robust. Um, and there's no biologically plausible way I can imagine, or that I've heard other much more uh, scientists who are much closer to the technology, imagine how this might play out badly in humans. Um, but if it, if something does play out badly, I think that's, uh, we'll, we'll be, well, we're in good position to hear about it early. Yeah. With that many people, moving so far that is a good point because you're right the the, when it first happened there were a few side effects and people were on top of those right away they were were like even four people that got some form of bell's palsy Um, that was reported in in the british tabloids Um, but you're right they came out they said if you have a history of allergic reactions to a lot of other things maybe this is something um that you shouldn't do so, so here's something else. This is very interesting. Um, I heard this yesterday too. That same person that that um, you know said the other thing to me about the DNA said, and you know, also when you take the vaccination, they're going to put a microchip in you to keep up with you <laughs> and monitor you. Um, now, like you, the speed of development. That's relatable to me, too. I think that's a natural reaction of people say, hey, it is a little quick. But um, I, I couldn't. I couldn't go with the microchip thing. I just wasn't in a frame of mind to, <laughs> to buy into that. So help us out with that one, Karen. Are, are they going to put microchips in, in all of us? Uh, no, that would be first of all. I mean, the cost of that would just be. <laughs> would be crazy. I don't, I'm not aware of any technology that would allow us to do that. Uh, meaning to make a microchip small enough to fit through a, a vaccination needle. Um, and no, you know, I think this is a reaction to Bill Gates's uh, involvement in um, supporting and funding a lot of vaccine development and other global health development worldwide. Um, but no, there's just no truth to that. I'm not sure exactly where that came from. Um, 
I, I, I get that there is a lot of concern and, um, and fear and suspicion about how um, go government and science, uh, the world of science are trying to control us. I think, yeah. you know, we've had just enough news about that actually happening, about actually being monitored, about government being very untrustworthy in many cases and really trying to advance certain policies at the expense of enormous groups of people um, that, yeah, I mean, why, why should we, they haven't, you know, a lot of these institutions really haven't earned our trust. So, um, so there's, I understand where a lot of this is coming from, but there's, there's, I, haven't, I haven't seen anything that really substantiates that. And besides folks, they really don't need to put microchips in all of us. <laughs> they've got Facebook. They got oh, your phone. <laughs> they got the phone. They got Facebook. So if y'all think, if you think there's monitoring, that's, that that's going to start with the COVID vaccine. I think you're a little late. <laughs> it's really great. Uh, um, they don't. And I'll be honest with you. So here in New York, I don't know if this this way in Georgia, there's this th there was this COVID tracing thing on the phone and people were concerned about it. But you know, I did it. I just went ahead and did it. I was like, you know, I, my attitude was if I'm if there's monitoring going on, it probably already is happening. So I'm just going to do the COVID one. I mean, it was no, it was no big deal. So like I say, I think it's a little late to be worried about that one. Okay. Um, if I have already had COVID, here's another one. I don't need to take the vaccine. Hmm. I'm immune. Is, is that true? So no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we don't really know how long immunity lasts either from COVID exposure, from actually having the disease, or from this vaccine. And that's also a function of how new this germ is to the world. We just don't, there's so much we don't know about it. So, I mean, we may find out in a couple of years that once you've been infected with COVID, you have an extremely, extremely tiny chance of actually, um, you know, having symptoms from being infected again. And you, but, but, we don't, first of all, don't know that yet. And what we do know is that um, when people are vaccinated for other infectious diseases, it doesn't keep them from getting infected with those diseases again. It usually just prevents them from getting sick and from spreading it. So we don't know what, you know, being infected with COVID itself, um, what we would call primary infection with COVID. We don't really know what that means for either, you know, your ability to get reinfected mm -hmm. or your ability to spread the uh, pathogen if you do get infected again. So mm -hmm. both of those things are, are major goals of getting a vaccine and um, what we're hoping will be a, a good result of taking the vaccine. So um, uh, we, we know at least the vaccine prevents people from becoming um infected uh becoming sick from infection again we don't yet know what the effect of the vaccine will be on people's ability to infect each other so um still and and i should add we do have a few reports of cases where people who uh who had the covid uh infection earlier became reinfected and became sick so we know that that can happen after you know just an organic infection with covid so all this to say um, even if you've already had COVID, probably a good idea to get vaccinated um, yeah. once you are able to. Um, it, it could end up being like the flu, right? I mean, we get flu shots every year. We don't get a flu shot once and don't get it the next year because you can still get the flu, right? It's That's good right. when it's good for that year. Right. Although the reason is a little different. The flu is okay. a very special virus and the fact that it it is very promiscuous. And so it, it changes the way it looks um, every year in, in certain parts of it. Um, you know, I just heard a conversation with um, with a scientist talking about whether we might, you know, because because this vaccine was made so quickly and is so effective. I mean, this is a way more effective vaccine than the flu vaccine, you realize. Like the flu vaccine on a good year is like 50% effective. It's, um, which is, I mean, it's it's a great improvement and it really, really helps to protect um, a particularly the most medically fragile people in our communities. But um, 
the coronavirus vaccines that we've seen, the data from them are, are very strong. So if people have been talking about, well, is this something that maybe we should be, this technology something we should be using for the flu vaccine? Um, because it might make the flu vaccine a little bit better. There are some barriers to that that we could talk about if you want, but um, it's uh, this is a very, this is a pretty effective vaccine. So it's exciting. So we touched on this before, um, the, Af- the African-American community. Yeah. Uh, last time we were here, you and I talked. And obviously there are, there are legitimate historical apprehensions mm-hmm. on the part of the African-American community. We all know that. But what people may not know. So I've been looking at this other uh, physician um, who's been tweeting uh, Eugene Gu or Ju Gu. Yeah. Um, And he's been talking about um, the disproportionate number of whites versus African-Americans in Moderna and Pfizer's clinical trials. So, so let, let me do this first. If, if your clinical trials only focus on one segment of the population or one primarily one race in the population, is that a good situation for African Americans? In other words, if he's saying that mostly whites win clinical trials, almost no African Americans, should that make African Americans more apprehensive? Or in fact, not just that, does that say anything about the effectiveness of the vaccine on African-Americans or other people of color at all? Great question, Mark. Um, And I think this is a really, really complicated question. So let's break it down a little bit. Please. So what happens in a vaccine trial? What happens is that um, a company in... uh, opens up a bunch of clinics in a bunch of cities and makes announcements that they are recruiting people to participate in the trial. And if you make a phone call, if you tear off the number from one of those sheets or you see it on the internet and you make a phone call, somebody will usually explain to you what's involved in the trial. And they usually tell you you have to make, you know, five visits in total. The first visit is an hour of intake. The second visit is labs. The third visit, you know, you actually get the vaccine. The fourth visit is an interim safety visit. The fifth visit is the second vaccine and the sixth. And it's usually a bunch of visits. Okay. And a, a, a fair amount of time and resources, right? Because you usually have to get from wherever you are to wherever the clinic is. And of course they want to maximize the uh, cross section. You know, they want to make their population that they enroll in their trials the best cross section of humanity that they can. Um, but in reality, you know, you need resources to participate in a clinical trial. And if you're in a city, which, like most American cities, uh, where resources are uh, are apportioned in higher amounts to you know by race, um, you're gonna have uh, certain racial disparities in the people that enroll in clinical trials. This is not a new phenomenon to this vaccine. Historically, there's broad underrepresentation of black folks in clinical trials throughout the United States for all kinds of medicines and all kinds of vaccines and biologics. For a lot of these reasons, it just doesn't, you know, if somebody lives in a part of town where they have, you know, an exploitative landlord and, you know, have to work badly paying jobs and have to use public transportation to get around. It's not as easy and fast as using a car in the city. You know, if it's inconvenient and doesn't pay and there's there's no incentive for, for a person of color to participate in, in one of these trials. So there's a lot of underrepresentation. And um, at the same time, there's overrepresentation of black folks and other people of color in the sector that is considered essential, work, essential workers right now, right? Okay. And so they're Um, The ones who have to be out and about have to be around other people and would therefore likely benefit the most from this vaccine. So this is a really not great situation, right? Um, The people who would benefit the most from the vaccine are the least represented in the trials of the vaccine. So there are a lot of places where I think anybody listening could say, oh, you know, here's things need to be changed to both raise the representation of black folks and other folks of color in vaccine trials and reduce their representation among the folks that, um, you know, are essential workers, or at least make, you know, make, make, give some equity to representation and all of that. Um, all that said, I think um, the differences that, uh, the other thing that makes this complicated is, you know, we have 
I, in medical school, learned that there were biologic differences in the way certain diseases impact uh, Black people compared to white people. I learned that certain drugs work better in white people than in Black people, or in Black people than white people for hypertension, for diabetes. What we've learned since I was in medical school is that a lot of those differences are actually not a consequence of biology, but are a consequence of social disparities, like being poor, not having access to good food, not having access to transportation, not understanding the things that your doctor is telling you, not trusting the things that your doctor is telling you. So there are there are a lot of differences in medicine between races that are actually not an issue of biology. Um, however, there are some differences that are biologic in the way people of different colors and different ethnicities process drugs. Now, these are, um, we're talking about how people's uh, liver enzymes process different kinds of um different kinds of medicines, different kinds of chemical compounds. Um, and, and this is uh, something that you can even look at genetically. Um, it, it affects how people are affected by um, painkillers, how people are affected by uh, tuberculosis drugs, all kinds of drugs. I don't think this vaccine would be in the category where there would, where you could really expect to see a big biologic difference between races. Um, but I do think that, you could expect that uh, people who are uh, black folks, for example, would just simply live higher risk lives by necessity of their jobs or their home situations than a white person would. And so um, we may see that, you know, if somebody, if, if I'm, if a white person is enrolled in a trial, I'm, I'm white, so I'm pointing at myself, but, um, and I, you know, and, and a black person is enrolled in the trial. Um, in the two weeks in between visits, um, you know, to the trial uh, clinic, I might get out of the house two times because I'm able to work from home. Meanwhile, if this person works, uh, you know, in a kitchen, they leave the house 14 times. So they just have more exposure, a higher risk, and their outcome might be different, even if the vaccine is very good. So, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, I think it, we may see different effectiveness levels once we disseminate the vaccine into populations of color. I don't necessarily think that those will be for a biological reason. I think they'll probably be more for social reasons if we see those differences. Um, And I do think that for those and other reasons, it's just really important for us to try and have um, black folks and other people of color in clinical trials, not just of vaccines, but of all medicines. Yeah. Yeah. But, but obviously there is this, um, apprehension in the black community. Um, a very rational one. I mean, it's really rational. If you have come up, if you have heard anything about Tuskegee, there are all these studies about, uh, you know, the closer you are actually to where this took, where Tuskegee took place. The, and the more you know about it, the more likely you are to distrust doctors. So this is a, a rational response. So I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just want to, Sure. No, no, you can already know. That, that, I mean, that's, I, I was, you know, leading up to you giving a response. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you this, uh, Dr. Lamb, before we go, because um, you, you mentioned something about, you know, some of the social disparities and whatnot in rural environment plays. Yeah. You know, and what I've been saying, because I've been talking to a lot of my own people, you know, we've just been talking. Are we going to do it? Are we not going to do it? People having that conversation. And one thing that, that we're hearing not just from African Americans, but I'm hearing some from some white folks. Some folk are saying, "Well, I'm not going to take it right away. I'm gonna wait a few months, yeah. just see if anything happens to anybody, and then <laughs> make sure." Uh, I've been hearing that, and again, I've been hearing white people say that. But I've been saying it to some of my African American friends. I said, "Well," and this goes to your point about you know the social disparity. Um, it might work out that way for us anyway, <laughs> because if there's not the kind of distribution there should be. Some of us in certain communities probably will not be the first ones to get it to begin with. Um, and, and that, too, is, is not necessarily something that in, endears one to. And I know we were talking about myths earlier, folks. These are myths. These are just real feelings, apprehensions that people have. Because that so there's double anxiety. Well, should I take it? And one and two, if I want to take it, 
Am I going to get access to it as soon as everybody else does? Is it going to cost me any money? All those types of things, they, they come up. And again, it speaks to what we sp- talked about before. We never should have been in this position. It, it, you know, we should have had adults at the table really trying to handle this COVID situation in, in a way where those other things would not be a distraction. Yeah. Um, so I know that there are a lot of institutions, both at the federal and at the state and at the local and at the grassroots levels that are working to make sure that the vaccine is distributed equitably to the, all the communities that are highest risk. Um, so I mean, we can get into the details of that in a second, but also that the information and education about the vaccine is distributed equitably. And that doesn't mean that everybody gets the same brochure. (laughs) It means that in communities where there are much higher levels of distrust, very, very different levels of sort of ways of engaging with the information that's available online, um, you know, and huge amounts of disinformation that um, educators about the vaccine engage with those communities um, in a way that's humble and sensitive and, um, and really for the greater good, working toward the greater good of that community. So um, that's what equity means in this situation. Um, and uh, I, I, I do think you're right. There's going to be a delay for most of us. I mean, what's what's what they're talking about having happened, the goal, I think the expected outcome right now is that they'll be able to vaccinate 40,000 highest risk people before the end of December. And, you know, there've been every time they've set a goalpost like that, it's been delayed. So we'll see if that actually happens, but great if it does. Um, And I I personally, because I'm not currently working clinically, I'm also way at the end of the line. So I will have an additional probably six-ish months of data um, to to look at before, uh, before I actually get a vaccine. And what we're the, you know, the information that we have now is based on um, half of the people enrolled in the vaccine trials um, having spent, having had at least two months of follow up after vaccine. So we're talking about thousands of people who've had at least two months uh, post vaccine and are doing well and have, you know, really no, no side effects to speak of. So, um, that's, I mean, to me, if, if somebody were to offer the vaccine to me right now, I would absolutely take it. I, I'm not, um, I'm not really worried about long-term side effects. I would, I would take it, I would prepare to stay home for a few days, um, and not work for a few days because it sounds like there's a a significant chance that it can make you feel kind of lousy, but I would still take it. Um, but yeah, I think it's going to be, uh, we need to manage our expectations about the rollout. This is going to, it's going to be a lengthy process. Um, and this is happening during a crazy time, you know, we're shifting administrations. Um, we have, you know, the outgoing administration, there's so many people just seem hell bent on having people just misunderstand things as, as well as they can. And just to inject as much chaos into the process. It's also, you know, Christmas time, there's a lot of shipping happening between, yeah. um, you know, retailers and people and people and people. And um, those same shippers are the ones who are going to be involved in distributing this vaccine. So um, yeah. now's not a great time for us to try to be rolling out a vaccine distribution program. But here we are. On that point, before I forget, um, it, people have also been intrigued about what they've heard. Not that anybody knows what this means. That's what I want to ask you about it. Okay. <laughs> How it has to be stored at a certain temperature. Yeah. And, you know, I never would have paid attention to that in any other time. Is that so ex- extraordinary? Because people had talked to me as if that's just the craziest thing they've ever heard. But is that really extraordinary for it is. vaccines? It is. Okay. Yeah. So vaccines, a lot of vaccines do require to be refrigerated. That's not unusual. But okay. mRNA vaccines, um, which we talked about in the very early part of the podcast, mm-hmm. um, mRNA is a very unstable compound and needs to be kept at a very, very cold, uh, extra cold. I want. I think it's like minus forty. Forget which unit, but it's a. It's an extraordinarily cold. Um, temperature colder than your usual freezer. So um, because of the type of vaccine it is, it does require a colder temperature. So it's unusual for a vaccine. 
to require this level of, of cold um, to be kept. But that's, uh, that is a feature of this. Yeah. Um, so folks, once again, being very much informed by Dr. Lamb, and that's what we need. We need information to make informed decisions. And of course, everybody has a right to make the decision that they want to make. Um, I was talking to another physician the other day who was on the show, Dr. Lenore of the uh, African American Wellness Project, but he did make a good point that, you know, even those who may feel like they don't want to take it, um, if you if we're ever going to get back to normal and if we're going to return to work and do the things we need to do, we're probably going to have to. Um, uh, uh, so, you know, all that has to be thought about. And as you alluded to, the essential people. So the, a lot of the essential workers working um, in the medical facilities and in the other service areas are black and brown people. So these are the people who need a vaccine the most mm -hmm. because they're going to be most exposed right away. As Dr. Lamb has said, folks, we have to go out of the house every day to work, can't work from home. Um, those are the people who need it most and may not get it unless the equity comes through, may not get it as readily. And then those are also the ones who need it most, but also are going to be the most apprehensive. So this is going to be uh, sort of a push and pull on us all. We'll, we'll just have to see what happens um, and um, hope for the very best. This is just the uh, beginning of, of what we hope is, is a climbing out of the situation we've been in. Uh, I hope you're right. And, you know, Mark, if I can just make one final plug, um, you raised it. I'm glad you did that there, you know, the participation in clinical trials is not, an, is not equal among uh, ethnicities and races in this country, such as they are. So, um, you know, it, it, and they're everywhere. They're enrolling everywhere. Um, and you don't necessarily, you can be a, a healthy person to participate in a lot of clinical trials and doing that really helps us feel more confident that the medicines and biologic products and vaccines that are out there are doing good for everyone. And that's, um, and that's good for, for everybody's community. If they feel confident that their community is represented among among that everyone. So just a plug for participation in clinical trials. Indeed, indeed. Dr. Karen Landman, thank you. Enjoy your the remainder of your holiday season, Hanukkah and all of that, right? Thank you. Same to you, Mark. Whatever you celebrate, I hope it's a wonderful told, and festive time. I told you, it's my birthday. I celebrate all of them. <laughs> birthday, Christmas, Kwanzaa, Hanukkah. If it's and when, if it's Ramadan, I celebrate that too. Whatever, whatever holiday celebration is happening this time of year, I'm in it. So you like a party. So uh, <laughs> happy, happy early birthday, Mark. Thank you so much. Bless you now. Thank All right. You. Take care. Thanks for getting woke and listening to Make It Plain. Please remember to listen, like, subscribe, and wherever you get your podcasts, please give the show a five star rating. And please do spread the word. Let's all continue to pray for each other during this pandemic and this police-demic. If all hearts and minds are clear, it has been made plain. Hey, I'm Andy. If you don't know me, it's probably because I'm not famous. But I did start a men's grooming company called Harry's. The idea for Harry's came out of a frustrating experience I had buying razor blades. Most brands were overpriced, overdesigned, and out of touch. At Harry's, our approach is simple. Here's our secret. We make sharp, durable blades and sell them at honest prices for as low as $2 each. We care about quality so much that we do some crazy things, like buy a world-class German blade factory. Obsessing over every detail means we're confident in offering a 100% quality guarantee. Millions of guys have already made the switch to Harry's. So thank you if you're one of them. And if you're not, we hope you give us a try with this special offer. Get a Harry starter set with a five-blade razor, weighted handle, shave gel, and a travel cover. All for just three bucks, plus free shipping. Just go to harrys.com and enter code FACE at checkout. That's harrys.com, code FACE. Enjoy!